You know, for the last several years, I've been digging into these stories pretty deeply, trying to understand them from the cultural background in which they exist, the historical background, looking at them also through the lens of Scripture itself. And one of the, I'm struck actually by, by a couple of things. One is there's a significant difference between how we often depict the story of Jesus' birth and probably what actually happened. I'm struck by, by how we tend to give it soft hues. We, we, we make it look nice and quiet and peaceful in many respects. And, and frankly, we make it look pretty old world European with barns and farm animals when it's really a, a pretty stark Middle Eastern story of caves and rocks, and, and it's pretty dry around Bethlehem. What strikes me the most in the stories themselves is actually what's included in the stories. Sometimes it gets overlooked in the very passages that we've heard tonight. Number one, the intentional choice by God. This choice of God to enter into this world and a very real world, not just this world of soft hues that often get painted. God chose to take on real skin and hair and breathe the very same breaths you and I breathe. And he, and he really did it in a rather unexpected, in fact, earth-shattering fashion. He, he didn't do it in a royal birth with lots of comfort in a wealthy place. But it's a hard and lonely birth. It's pretty homeless. In fact, it's it's fairly unwanted. A young woman, really by our standards, a girl, maybe 13, 14 years old. That would have been the norm for that culture. And there she is, and we have to recognize she gave birth like every other woman has given birth, so she's crying out in agony. And really, if we look deep at the story, it appears she's pretty alone. In fact, she's given birth in a place fit only for animals. And in Bethlehem, that means a cave. And the reason she's doing that is because, as the scriptures say, literally, there was no place for them. Not, not in an inn. It's not really the word. The word means guest room. That means that there was no one in Bethlehem who was willing to give up their guest room. And this is Joseph's family village. And this is an extremely hospitable culture. And the Gospels say there's just no place for them. This story takes place hard, lonely, agonizing, Desperate, chaotic. It's remarkable to, me, remarkable to me also that really the only ones who are invited to the whole thing are shepherds. And shepherds in this culture, they're really considered dirty, unclean by religious standards. Most people didn't trust them, thought they were thieves. And yet God chooses shepherds to send a messenger to and let them know that a baby's been born. You ever recognize that the angel tells them the sign by which they're to find this baby? I mean, this is a tiny little town. There's probably one birth that day in the whole town. And it's not just go find the baby. 
It's, here's the sign. You'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Have you ever asked the question, why is that the sign? I think it's because it harkens back to Scripture. There's only one other place where swaddling cloths is spoken of and one other place where a manger is spoken of. It comes in prophecy. The prophet Ezekiel says this. This is God saying, as for your birth, he's speaking of his people in his city, Jerusalem. As for your birth on the day you were born, your cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to cleanse you, nor rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling cloths. No eye pitied you to do any of these things to you out of compassion for you, but you were cast out on the open field, for you were abhorred on the day that you were born. That just sounds hard and lonely, doesn't it? And yet God says this, And when I passed by and saw you wallowing in your blood, I said to you in your blood, Live. I said to you in your blood, Live. The prophet Isaiah, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Children have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, the donkey its master's crib. But Israel does not know, my people do not understand. Swaddling cloths and a manger become signs for shepherds because this life, this birth, comes into the grit and the grime and the poverty of actual and real life. And it's God's choice. And it has always been part of God's plan to save and make new and give life, real life. It's this gift of life and the earth-shattering manner in which God offers it to us then that leads to the other thing that I'm really struck by in these nativity scenes in Matthew and Luke. And, and that's how people respond to the announcements and the ri- arrival of this little baby named God's salvation. God with us. See, the word for Jesus in Hebrew is Yeshua, and it comes from the Hebrew word Yesha. So it makes sense in Hebrew. Yeshua, God saves. The question is, though, will we want the very life that God lives, gives us? Or will we be those who would reject it? The ox knows its owner, the donkey, donkey its manger, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Well, let's consider just a few of the ways of responding to this. Mary, Ma- Mary expects that if these events are going to actually take place, they will only happen with God's miraculous intervention. And Mary surrenders her life to God's will and to God's way even though I suspect it meant experiencing a great deal of shame in her culture. Joseph. Have you ever realized that Joseph never says a word in all of Scripture? He's the strong, silent type, right? And yet he's willing to believe a dream and the angel's message in it. Believe that these words come from God. And he trusts And he obeys, even though it goes against his own understanding of the right way of doing things. And he's given the remarkable privilege of naming this baby Yeshua. God saves. And then there's the shepherds, the bottom of the barrel of society. Here they are, given an announcement by the entire army of God. And what do they do? They get up and they go and they see and then they become the world's first apostles. They tell everybody they can and they give God glory and honor and praise. Those things strike me and lead me to ask the questions. 
Are we willing to let this very same Jesus into our lives? Are we willing to make similar responses, to be encountered in the very same manner in which he actually came with real skin, breathing real air, into the very real chaos of the very real world as Yeshua, God who saves? So then, how will we, how are we responding? I mean, what if Mary had said no? It's asking too much. That's just too hard. What if Joseph had said, (laughs) that's a crazy dream. Couldn't be real, right? What if shepherds had said, wow, that was a great show. Spiritually deep. Really awesome. But hey, it's over. Let's go back to work. The message of Christmas isn't just some religious message for a a, a corner of our lives or our time, some little place that we might give over to spiritual concerns, to religious moments or programs. We don't have these stories handed down over 2,000 years just so that we could admire them from a distance or paint pretty pictures, or think nice thoughts about God once a year or so. I mean, Jesus entered into the grit and the grime and the chaos of very real life so that we also might live, really live. Jesus is God saves as God with us, not merely so we can go to heaven when we die, but so that we can live fully right now live in the very manner and the fullness of the way in which we were always meant to live in right relationship with God and with one another. God comes as Savior wearing human skin so that our rebellion and rejection of the love and the way of living in relationship with God might be redeemed actually right here and now, not off in the distance. The ways of mercy, justice, compassion for one another. We're invited into participating with God right here and now. The ways of walking into the broken places and the chaotic lives around the world to be the very people through whom God offers this saving, rescuing, defending love. Trust and obey. Walk into the unknown. Give God the glory and the honor with our whole lives. Jesus still is God with us in our very real everyday life. In fact, he's more real than anything else. So what's our response? How will we respond? How are we responding to the very God who saves to the very God who is still with us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this evening and the opportunity to hear these words and sing these songs and share some life together. We thank you the very most for your son, Jesus Christ. And that he really did come into this world in real skin and live a real life just like we do so that we may actually have real life. We ask your blessing upon our lives to know and understand more and more what it means that you are God who saves God who's with us, God who invites us into life, calls us to walk with you, even into some of the very same chaos and brokenness. Father, tonight we know there's a lot of brokenness. There's a lot of chaos. We know that's true in this world in unbelievably stark ways. 
but we know it's true in ways right around our own building in this community. And in some ways, they're incredibly hidden or in ways that we don't really want to look. So, Father, this evening, this night especially, we would ask your blessing on those who, like Mary and Joseph, were homeless and unwanted and wandering and cold and lonely. We ask, come Lord Jesus, and be the one who saves, even us. We ask this in Christ's name, amen. I invite you to a time of responding to God's word with the offering of your own lives. We're also going to take an offering of money this evening, uh, like it has been done in many years past. The offering, unless you designate it for something special, even to designate it for the general fund, if it's simply that you write a check or give cash, it's going to our mission fund. We support a lot of different mission opportunities and missionaries around this world, more than 25, actually. Some right here in this community, some in a lot of different continents. And so tonight's offering of all three services is going to support mission work that happens uh, through this church, through some of the very people that, in fact, you may be sitting next to right now.